Hello, I'm Janice Ellig, CEO of the Ellig Group, Executive Search Advisors, where we are reimagining search by our longstanding commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you for joining me today for another webinar series where we invite thought leaders and subject matter experts to help guide us through these turbulent times. Today's topic is about CDOs at the heart of driving transformation. And I am delighted to welcome today's guest, David Matheson, who has had an extraordinary career as an entrepreneur and corporate leader. He was at Thomson Reuters pioneering the online content development. And prior to his being the founder and CEO of the CDO Summit and CDO Club, he was an entrepreneur and started a company called Connectic, which was sold to Oracle during his career. So it's really wonderful to have David here. He is the world's authority on chief digital officers, chief data officers, and chief data scientists. So David, welcome to our program today. I'm delighted to have you here with us. And I wanted to tell the audience that we will be taking questions throughout the program. So please give us your questions. And if we can't get to all of them, we will send you um, in an email the response. So David, welcome for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Jonathan. It's great to see you again. Yes, and you know, before we dive into um, where we are today with COVID-19 and how we have really accelerated the need for data scientists, digital officers, whatever, and, and all of this that's going on, tell us the genesis. How did you incubate this idea? How did this come about? Was it a particular industry that got you interested in starting the CDO Club and the CDO Summit? Well, I was inspired by you and, and your work with Alec Group. You know, this was incubated, uh, the CDO Club and the CDO Summit was really incubated at a time when I was working with you. Um, you know, really what was happening was I was managing director of digital media uh, at your firm. And my goal was to find all those people who were sort of C-suite in charge of digital transformation, data-driven culture and cybersecurity. And it became pretty apparent to me after just a couple of weeks with you that, you know, there were an unbelievable number of CDOs and CAOs being hired around the world at some of the biggest, most prestigious companies. And obviously, you don't get C-suite titles coming around like that and being adopted so quickly across the C-suite without some reasoning behind it. And I remember a turning point. Uh, you had had me speak at the Harvard Club. Uh, David Lord has a very big HR practice with CHROs and others. And he had gathered around 200 top level CHROs in 2011 and invited me to speak on my findings. I think you recall you had in, in, encouraged me to write a white paper, really what they call in executive recruitment terms, a talent map. You know, what's the compensation structure, reporting structure? Uh, what are their skill sets? Who do they report to? Who reports to them? So I created this draft of that, that talent map and presented it to David Lord's uh, CHRO group at the Harvard Club and they were just like, oh my God, what's going on here? You know, we've never heard of this title. And then of course, back in the day in, in 2011, 2012, there were only a few hundred people on earth with that exact title. And now, as you know, you know, there are thousands of people with each of those titles at some of the world's most prestigious organizations. Right. And the pandemic has only accelerated that and especially in healthcare. So, you know, kudos to you for helping, you know, see this and help incubate it. And really what's happened since then is just an explosion and we can get into the differences and the nuances, but the big, the big, you know, strike point was the financial crisis of 2008. You know, we really saw uh, government step in around the world and say, especially in financial services, medical and pharma, you know, you need more governance and oversight over your data. And it encouraged the rise of that C-suite title, chief data officer, chief analytics. And of course on chief digital, we're seeing that mostly at incumbents but now even startups are being disrupted too. So we're seeing chief digital officers being hired at both incumbents and startups. So thanks to you, Janice, for having the foresight to, to see this so many years ago. Well, David, we were fortunate to have you and we followed your career that the eight years that you've been doing this, been part of your summit, which is extraordinary. But it really started more in the media area, didn't it? It wasn't, and then financial services. So it's evolved to where we are today. Could you show us about, you know, been, having been to your summit, um, I'm really impressed with the speakers you have there. Do you have some screens where you can show us who the speakers are, the topics they're covering, because they're so broad and wonderful. So we'll take the two uh, separate. So chief digital officers first and then chief data officers. Yeah. But really companies started hiring chief digital officers in the early days 
you know, media was one of the first. It was really a reaction to the disruption caused by Napster. And um, so we saw the first ever chief digital officer hire was Jason Hirschhorn and, uh, in 2004, which again, more of a defensive posture. And then NBC Universal, right after that, 2005, hired their first chief digital officer. But now the disruption is everywhere. So starting in 2013, you know, 2004, 2005 on digital, it was really, the disruption was in media, entertainment, publishing, music. So we saw a lot of chief digital officer hired there. But now disruption is everywhere. So now we're seeing, you know, chief digital officers hired in oil and gas, energy, you know, you name it, just about any sector and even in executive recruitment. The difference between that and chief data, we really saw the turning point, as I mentioned before, in 2008, because chief data officers were required to come in and provide more governance. And we really saw the, the growth there in uh, public in more in uh, banking, insurance, financial services, medical and pharma. But now again, chief data officers are everywhere. So just one example of what we do at the CDO club is since 2013, we've been giving out the CDO of the year award, both for digital and data. And just very briefly, I think you can see here, we give it out in Japan, we give it out in the US, Australia, uh, the European Union and the UK. And you know, the backgrounds of some of these people are pretty incredible. I mean, you know, uh, Thomas, uh, Fred Santarpia, he was chief digital officer at Condé Nast for, for seven years. Atif Rafiq is a great example. You could see him there. He's one who moved up from chief digital to president of, uh, of commercial growth at MGM. But he was CDO at Volvo Cars. He was CDO at McDonald's. So what a great skill set this is that executives can jump so smoothly and effortlessly from sector to sector. And it's really because boards and companies are looking to these people for the strategic advice that they can offer. And that goes across sectors. And we're going to get to that, the role of the board here and the information they need. But at the executive level, the CEOs that you speak to and the chief digital and data officers that you know, I mean, they're being leaned on more and more, aren't they, by their CEOs, by their boards in terms of providing that data. So what is on the minds of the CEOs and the executive teams at these companies today that CDOs, whether it be data or digital or scientists, need to address, what, what, what are the critical things that are on the minds of CEOs and executive teams today? Right, so you know, in the uh, mo recent past, if we go back six months when sort of everything was normal, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I can give you the easy answer to that. It gets a little bit more complex with COVID and you know, uh, the priorities that are happening now. But you know, previous to COVID and also unbundle, let's unbundle the pandemic from civil unrest because they're two separate approaches to leadership. But six months ago, you know, these CDOs and CAOs are generally reporting into the CEO and the board. They've generally got dedicated headcount and uh, market and, and budget. Uh, so they don't need to pull from IT or to mar from marketing to really see the vision through. The other big trend we're seeing is a lot of CDOs are being, chief digital officers are being hired now by the board and the CEO as CEO of succession plans. This isn't projection on my part, this is actually happening, and we track all this in real time as well. So we're seeing uh, not only the CEO succession plan, but we're also seeing uh, CDOs becoming board directors of publicly traded companies and taking that CEO slot. So you know, I've got a slide here just uh, a few months ago, we saw that same uh, thing happen with um, the, uh, uh, number of CDOs who took board slots. So for example, you know, we have uh, over uh, 13 CDOs became board directors in just the first six months of this year. And that's twice as many CDOs who became board directors from, from, compared to all of last year. So just being called on to do these, you know, incredible tasks. So now let's move to today, right? You had two things happening. One was the pandemic and two was the civil unrest. And from a leadership perspective, we see a difference in leadership style. And it's pretty, been pretty clear to me, the approach to deal with the pandemic has been more data-driven, digital-driven. It's all about technology. How do we get work from home for 100,000 employees? How do we get you know, everybody to be able to do Zoom conferences? Uh, that's technical in nature. But leadership from these CDOs during the civil unrest I think is a more of a humane approach from the heart, 
uh, much more of a listening exercise than a leadership exercise, listening to your employees, calling everybody together, finding out what their issues are. And again, totally different approach to leadership. And uh, you know, we're in uncharted territories, but the fascinating thing is we're really watching in real time transformative leadership right in front of our eyes. And a lot of these people are really coming up to the plate and pulling out you know, stuff that they were might, must, you know, maybe nice to haves on the digital roadmap six months from now have now been fully implemented in just the last three to five months. So it's the technology, but also the compassion of the CEO on the, you know, I heard Mary Barr on, on uh, CNBC say one morning, she was on a listening tour visiting the different manufacturing sites to hear what was on the minds of people, you know, so that's very important. We have a couple of questions and I want to get to them so that we don't lose this, Dave. Uh, David, how do you see the roles difference, uh, the difference of the roles between the chief data officer and the chief digital officer, and more recently, the chief data and analytics officer? So how are those roles somewhat different? Yeah, you know, I had the chief digital officers of the year up there. Here's a few of them. Uh, this from 2019 to 2017. Here's digital. It goes all the way back to 2013. And you can see by their backgrounds, you know, uh, these people are de dealing in digital transformation. You know, how do we take an analog company to digital or for an already digital company? How do we amplify their offerings? Let's go over to the chief data officers of the year. We've been doing this since 2016. And it's probably pretty instructive to look at their backgrounds to give you an idea of what the differences are, right? Digital, mostly in charge of digital transformation. Data officers, chief data officers are mostly in charge of infrastructure and governance and privacy and AI, machine learning, deep learning. They're the ones who are really pulling this all together. There is a separate function that we see evolving now. Probably the biggest growth, I think, in the future are the chief analytics officers or CAOs. Mm -hmm. CAOs, once that governance and that architecture and the infrastructure is set, the CAOs are the ones who are really looking at all that data and combining their left and right brain to be a number cruncher, but then also bubble up that to the C-suite and their colleagues so that they, they can explain that data to people. So we're about to give out our first ever Chief Analytics Officer of the Year Award. But I would say, Janice, from an executive search and a leadership perspective, probably the best Venn diagram I can give you is, if you look at a first circle of Chief Digital and the second overlapping circle of Chief Data and that third overlapping circle of Chief Analytics, I believe that the future leaders of society are in that middle circle. They know uh -huh. digital transformation, they've got data and they understand analytics. And they're that, in that sweet spot of having a good understanding of each of these practices to be able to lead the company into the future. And that's why we're seeing a lot of chief digital officers you know, head in that direction, that career path of going to CEO and to board director is a natural fit. Yeah, that's a very interesting diagram you just drew. And I, we'll keep that in mind on our executive search work that we hopefully will do with you, David, as well. So that somebody asks, you know, what is the career path to becoming a chief data officer or maybe even that intersection where you have all of those skills? What are the paths there? Yeah, well, we see it more on digital. So, you know, I track chief digital officers who've become CEO and, you know, we're up to about 150. And that's doesn't sound like a lot, but when you compare that, there's only 10,000 or so people with that title. Percentage-wise, that's incredible compared to all of the CIOs and CTOs, hundreds of thousands of CMOs who never become CEO. So when you scratch the surface to say, hmm, how did they get there? The interesting thing is they've already been there. So I found that 65% of chief digital officers who became CEO were previously CEO, president, or executive director. So it kind of makes sense. It is their career path. But on the data side, we're not seeing as many of those people become CEO. And I think the reason is it's pretty intuitive for someone like you. They don't have the sales or marketing or ops or finance experience across the C-suite. Chief data officers and chief analytics officers are usually much more technical and much more data focused. And they don't have the EQ. They've got the IQ, but not necessarily the ability to manage the rest of the C-suite. So we're not seeing as many of those people become CEO. But I would say critically important for more data people to get on boards. Boards really need to understand the data and the privacy issues and the security issues that surround it. But maybe for the data officers actually to do laterals and go on the other, other paths so that they can get into that intersection that you were talking about. Uh, That's somebody right. else says, um, data is the new digital, faster and more accurate fortune telling is becoming a new strength. So do we need a, a, maybe a new or revised definition of the CDO? 
Yeah, fortune teller. That, that is a great, <laughs> like right now, that's what we need, right? So yeah. there are usually really big tech enablers that happen, you know, once a decade. And I think the best example of this was, was the iPhone in 2007. It put the power of computing in everyone's hands, right? But wars, catastrophic events, floods, um, pandemics like this one, throw everything out the window. This has been probably the biggest accelerant of digital transformation in our lifetimes. And that go, that, that's a pretty bold statement because it includes things like the iPhone. So as a strategy, you know, as a fortune teller, you know, more important than ever before is that key characteristic, mostly of the chief digital side is, they're usually the people that are seeing three, four, five years ahead. They have their head in the clouds, but they definitely have their feet on the ground because there's a lot of people who are futurists and you know, you know, fortune tellers who can't actually execute a plan and get you from A to Z. These chief digital officers are people who have their feet firmly pointed on the ground. They roll up their sleeves, they're operations people, and they can get us from there to here. And thank God for that, because over the, six, the last six months, that's exactly what we've all needed. If we want to get DoorDash, if we want our medical supplies delivered, if we want remote medicine and telehealth, thank God we've got people like chief digital officers at National Institutes of Health and Centers for Disease Control and hospitals and places like Humana to be able to deliver this stuff for us because those are the people who are really behind the scenes helping us get everything we need delivered to our homes. So David, talk a little bit more about you know how COVID-19 has accelerated the telemedicine you know, and how that's impacting um, our whole healthcare system today. Yeah, you know, I've got a slide up of, you know, the companies that are at risk and companies in the strong position. And certainly, um, you know, we've oh, yeah. seen mm -hmm. challenges in commercial real estate, hospitality, et cetera. But the more important role is obviously the, um, the chief uh, digital officers and data officers in healthcare. So the amazing thing that's happened is if we go back to the iPhone, the reason I brought it up was, I'm not sure that many people know, but originally designed into the original iPhone were sensors so that you could monitor people's breath for alcohol, you know, alcohol. They have all this now as add-ons, but the reason Apple decided against it was they would have had to be FDA approved. It would have needed to be a medical device. And I really believe we would have seen a lot more digital transformation in healthcare, you know, if they had gone down that road in 2007. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the times have caught up to medicine and, uh, and now we're seeing everything from you know, as I mentioned before, we've got chatbots and, you know, remote health and telemedicine. So you don't have to wait in line, you know, chatbots so that you can get your replies answered relatively quickly without waiting in line. And then that gives more information to the primary care physician or to the nurse so that you can accelerate the, the, the responses and the replies. So, you know, I think everything from the data that we're getting from government agencies, everything from National Institutes of Health, Centers for Disease Control, that inform things like patient tracking uh, so that we can understand how far this disease is spreading all the way through to the last line, which is you know, your local deli that can now you know, send you uh, goods and supplies all the way to CVS and others uh, so that you don't have to go out and wait in line. These are all things that were, again, nice to have on that transformation roadmap for you know, three or four years from now. They've all been fully implemented. So it's just amazing what has taken place in the last six months. And do you see the future impact on the healthcare industry even more so going forward? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think um, we were, you know, it's, it's a, a mixed, it's a curse, absolutely a pandemic. But when I brought up before, digital accelerants or anything that accelerates change, they're usually, they're usually tech driven. But, you know, people from World War I, people from World War II, if you call the space race another tech enabler, you know, this was one that was impo that was imposed upon us, and it's been you know amazing to see that all of those things that were sort of futuristic, you know. And again, I, I turn to uh, remote health and telemedicine. Uh, having this stuff, you know, fully implemented now is uh, stuff that should have been done anyway, in my opinion. So it's a, it's kind of a double-edged sword to see this pandemic. Hopefully, you know, we'll see our way through it. But it looks like we may come out of it with some amazing, you know, transformation. Maybe we have a very, another very interesting question. Um, could you please comment on how chief data officers and chief digital officers might collaborate and their roles might converge in the future? Yeah, we see great examples of that. I think the best uh, 
way to make sure that happens, and I think you'd agree, Janice, is you got to get that job description right, right? So yeah. the job description is usually written with the board and the CEO's approval, and you've also interviewed other members of the suite, C-suite, and the important thing there is a delineation, a very fine delineation of roles and responsibilities across the C-suite, so that, you know, when you bring on a new chief data or chief digital officer, they're not, the CMO isn't feeling like their job's uh, threatened they see it as an opportunity to collaborate. And so to build in that collaboration from the get-go, from the job description and the offer letter is really crucially important. And then also encouraging, you know, breakdown of silos uh, accord, uh, amongst the group. One amazing webinar that we're about to put on with IBM in August is exactly that, CDOs working together, CDOs and CTOs. And what we're doing for that one is we're bringing in people to interview who have good working relationships with their C-suite partners. So USAA, we're bringing in the CTO and the CDO. We know they work together. So for your listeners, that might be a good one to tune into because we're actually going to be interviewing those people who are dynamic duos at their organization. So how do our listeners tune into that, David? I'll put in the chat, I'll put a link to the, uh, okay. to the next webinar for them. Great. Well, we, when we uh, post this on our website and on your website, this particular webinar, we'll put that link there so people can go hear that. That would be very interesting. And are there specific examples where you have seen people go from chief digital to data or combine their jobs? Yeah, a good example is Rachel Hout Stern, who was chief digital officer for Governor uh, for Mayor Bloomberg. And in 2014, the CDO Club gave her the CDO of the Year Award. And the reasons that I gave it to her were exactly what you point out, right? Rachel, first of all, is amazing. Uh, she was really solid in digital transformation. By the way, after she was chief digital officer for Mayor Bloomberg in New York City, she became chief digital officer for Governor Cuomo for New York State. And the reason I gave her the award was one, she was really good at digital. And what I mean by that is we had specific examples. She created a 20 point blueprint or roadmap. And not only did they tick off every single um, item on that blueprint, but they also added six more. But in that blueprint also included that they wanted to release a number of data sets to the public. I think it was 200. Well, one of the things she did was she actually released 2000 data sets to the public. And you can imagine once you release those data sets, now you can have the crowd go out and build applications on top of that data. Everything from where's the local potholes or you know, where are the most murders occurring in New York City. So she understood digital too. She understood data. Number three, she was really good at social media. She was always tracking in the top one, two or three in uh, CDOs with strong social media presences. And also lastly, she understood the importance of tying all this together in a holistic framework. In other words, bringing in academia like Will Cornell and Columbia. And she brought up startup.gov, which was for startups in New York City. She brought together government and she brought together companies. She was like the whole package. And that's what we encourage in CDOs, people who really have a good understanding of digital and a good understanding of data, and either they're working well with their chief data officer, or they take those responsibility and that title too. So David, earlier you mentioned that a number of um, chief digital data officers have gone on boards. Uh, some have gone you know, on to be president, maybe even CEO of a company, but then they've also gone on boards. So as boards today grapple with many questions and many to do with cyber issues and digital issues and having to go virtual overnight with you know, 30,000 employees, 100,000 employees, whatever globally. Um, there are, are a number of boards that do not have that expertise around the table, right? So should they? Yeah. Um, and if you know, people like you and others, what's the true value add or do you just hire somebody to advise a board? And if you're not you know, experienced at the board table in the areas that you were talking about today, what questions do you ask so that you do know what's going on? Yeah, I mean, ideally, it would be to have somebody who has your expertise and the expertise of many of your colleagues in the CDO club. But what is a board to do today if they don't have that, besides bring you on board? <laughs> yeah, I mean, my one sentence board summary is, I help boards assess and mitigate risk in three core areas. One, digital transformation. Two, data and analytics. Three, cybersecurity. If boards don't have somebody on that has digital or data or security uh, experience, they're really in trouble and it couldn't be more uh, important than the last six months. And so we've been tracking this. That's the slide that I have up now. 
you know, you can go through those links. You, you see the page, go find this up at the top. Right. Uh, all of those links are live. The amazing, I'm, I'm not going to say it's amazing. It's natural, right? We've been tracking CDOs who've become board directors of publicly traded companies since 2007. And again, you know, the big news that we had for this first half of the year was that 13 chief digital officers joined boards of publicly traded companies in the first quarter. And that's more than, you know, there were, there were only six all of last year. So you could see it's already increasing. And uh, by the way, nine of those 13 board directors were female. So the majority of board placements, you know, were, were female as well. So, you know, I think our, the question boards need to ask themselves is, you know, is my company at risk? And where are those risk factors? And clearly the risk factors are coming from, you know, digital transformation. Just look at data. You know, the questions they would have to ask is, you know, who owns the data? Do we have the right to use that data? Is, this, is the data in a format that can be, gotten, can be delivered to all of our constituents effectively and smoothly with the understanding of who owns that data and what it, how it can be used? Um, then is that data secure? Especially in healthcare, you've got HIPAA, you know, and then the bigger regulations around GDPR and the California privacy regulation, you know, <laughs> the board is at risk because GDPR alone, it, you're at risk, I think up to 5% of your annual revenues, you know, per violation. This is a significant fine and uh, companies that are not aware of it, you know, are at serious risk. And the last is cybersecurity. You know, so out of the three, what happens if you have a breach tomorrow? Oh, companies are not analyzing and instituting proactive and prescriptive and prophylactic measures for cybersecurity, you're at the risk of breach, then the whole company could, could disappear overnight. So these are all serious concerns. And that's why, you know, again, I'm not projecting, we're just reporting. There is an increasing number of chief digital officers who are becoming CEO and board directors. And it absolutely makes sense. So David, two more quick questions for you. Uh, what are the key skills that you see as essential for someone to, who aspired to be a CDO? And then what happens to the chief information officer with a, when you have a CDO, CAO, chief data officer? The essential skills for a chief digital officer kind of remained unchanged. You know, we see them, and again, when I scratch the surface of their backgrounds, I'm always thinking outside of, you know, public service, government, and sort of nonprofit, for-profit enterprises, I'm always thinking in the back of my head, is this someone who can run the company in three to five years? Is this mm -hmm. someone who's gonna be able to take on those responsibilities? So I always look at their backgrounds and see if they've got management experience, president, executive director, managing director, you know, CEO. And if not, have they held roles, chief product officer, chief strategy officer, chief sales officer, where they're really responsible for the bottom line, you know, and bringing in the products and the teams necessary to take that company from analog to digital or to enhance their digital offerings. So that's on the digital side. I would say now it's a lot more fortune teller, you know, given the pandemic, a lot more, you know, you've got to be able to hit the ground running. You know, one data point there, Janice, that I don't want to miss is normally at the CDO club, we get dozens of requests a week on both the supply side and demand side for new talent. Since January, I've only got one request. One CDO reached out to me and said, I'm looking for a new job. It was from Bed Bath & Beyond and they filled that role within two months. So to me, what that says is if nobody's looking, nobody, either the supply, you know, from CHROs to executive recruiters like you, we're not getting a lot of calls. And it says to me, these guys are fully engaged. They're fully maxed out. They're working, they're happy, and they're satisfied. Compare that to six months ago when there were more jobs than people. There were millions more jobs than people. The candidates had the leverage. Now the companies do, but basically these, these people are fully engaged. So that's digital. On data to become a good chief data officer, you really, you know, you, anybody can be a number cruncher today. You can understand Python and Ruby on Rails, but the way to get to the C-suite is to actually be able to talk to your C-suite colleagues, manage your peers, manage across the C-suite, manage up to the CEO and the board. And so what do you need? You need governance, you need ethics, you need privacy, you need to understand, you know, security, uh, architecture, metadata, taxonomy, folksonomies, but most importantly, C-suite characteristics of being able to work well with your peers. Is the chief information officer blending in though with these other roles? Yeah, so, you know, in the early days, you know, we were, we were lucky to get Gartner to buy in. Gartner was one of the biggest proponents of this title, the CDO, because their big base was CIOs and CTOs. Right. And they felt, you know, 10 years ago, rightly so, 
that CIO responsibilities were being, you know, hardware is being outsourced to the cloud, software is being outsourced to India, you know, tech support, et cetera, is being outsourced to other countries. What's left for the CIO? So what we've been encouraging them to do is to take on some of those digital transformation responsibilities, take on the responsibilities for data. And in a lot of cases, we don't see CDOs at companies, we see CIOs taking on that responsibility. And by the way, we see a lot of hybrid titles as well, like chief information and digital officer, chief technology and digital officer. We see that a lot as well. So it really just depends on the company and whether that CIO has the authority and the desire and the skill sets to take on digital and data responsibilities. So David, when is your next summit that we can all attend virtually or in person? <laughs> yeah, we're doing a series of summits with IBM and I'll put that in the chat where okay. people can register. And we're doing those online once a month, every month till uh, November. Our next one is August 12th on exactly this topic. How do CIOs and CDOs work together? Perfect. So the trend, what we see, it's just going to increase and the need for really the specialization, but also being able to execute and be commercial is really important. How to run a company, right? Because you yeah. may be doing that down the road, but you need the data. So we see this really in our search work just increasing. Do you see the trend just as we go post COVID-19 at some point continuing to uh, accelerate? Yeah, absolutely. You know, eventually we're going to come out of this and we're going to need people with fresh eyes and fresh skills and the people who were successful over the last six months, those are the exemplars. Those are the people we're going to look to. Um, I don't, you know, although I've seen hiring slow down over the last six months, I haven't seen many people looking for jobs. It's kind of an odd situation that we're in, but I would say, you know, hopefully when we clear out of this, we're going to see, you know, more companies uh, higher up and scale up. By the way, even though Bed Bath & Beyond and retail in general is suffering, Macy's just hired a chief digital officer, right? So you're, wh where they cut, they've already cut events and you know, marketing and research and development and you know, uh, work from home has cut expense for office space. Um, then they start to cut strategy and others, but they're, where they're not cutting, even in those susceptible industries like retail, they're not cutting the, uh, the online people, the e-commerce people because if they're trying to drag Macy's into the online world, they're going to need all those people who have the skills in, you know, online e-commerce and online and digital and data. That's what we're seeing too. So, you know, in some areas, maybe it's, it's come down a little bit, but search has not gone away. Companies recognize that there's talent out there and they're going after it now as some downsides, but others are saying, I'm going to invest for the future. And I think, you know, people at your, in your CDO club are going to be tapped more and more. And I look forward, David, to working on more searches with you. So um, we're going to have to have you back because we're out of time now, but this has been so informative. And so we'll let everybody know what is on the agenda for the CDO club and CDO summit. So any parting words before we leave? Yeah, again, thanks for your vision on this, Jens. There were only a couple of hundred 10 years ago, and here we are. It's like these titles are being called on to perform Herculean tasks, and they've delivered. So kudos to you, and I agree with you on the product side. A lot of CDOs we're seeing now are coming up with CPO background or Chief Product Officer experience background, too. So exciting times and heady times, and I wouldn't be here, and we wouldn't be doing this. We wouldn't have this community if it wasn't for you and the Ellie Group. So thank you again, Janice. Your vision really... Uh, help propel an entire industry. Well, you're the visionary. We're just following your lead all around the globe as you put on these summits and they're really fabulous. So thank you for allowing us to participate and be a sponsor as well. So to our audience, thank you for being with us today. David Matheson, thank you. We'll have to have you back again. And to everybody, please stay safe and um, we will see you in the very near future on another webinar. Visit our website to see the other webinars we have done and the upcoming ones with great thought leaders like David Matheson. David, thank you so much.